Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Corey Doctorow. Corey, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Corey Doctorow. I'm a science fiction novelist and activist. I've written more than 20 books. I work with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I have a, uh, a blog slash newsletter at pluralistic.net. Thank you so much for coming on today. I've been reading you for a long time, and we're going to be talking about a piece that you wrote a couple of months ago. It ran in Wired, and the link will be in the show notes, and you also you put all your stuff in um, like your own site without ads and stuff like that. Is that right? So that link will be there as well. Yeah. To be, to be clear, actually, that website is Creative Commons attribution only. So people, including Wired, can commercially republish what's there. So Wired didn't buy the article from me. They just picked it up. Oh, that's interesting. It from my blog. So the canonical version is at pluralistic.net. Okay, great. Well, then the first link will be to the canonical version. Yeah. Well, that, that, the headline that, that Wired gave it was the quote, and shitification of TikTok. That was my headline. <laughs> there you go. And, and I, I mean, in shitification is, is this a, did you coin this yourself or did, or you take it from yeah. someone else? Yeah, I, I did. I did a, like a, a deep web search and I found someone who used it on Twitter in 2012. Uh, but as far <laughs> as I know, I independently reinvented it. Okay. Uh, this, I mean, send this to, you know, OED and Miriam Webster. Cause I think like what you lay out describes a lot of online life and maybe <laughs> offline life sure. as well. So, okay. So what is in shitification? How would you define it? So, you know, look, I, I am an old guy. I have been writing the web for more than 20 <laughs> years. I am now in my fifties. I have two artificial hips. As soon as I finish the three book tours I have scheduled for this year, I'm having double cataract surgery. And so as an old person, it is my job to say things used to be better, but I really think they were. I really think that 20 years ago, the web wasn't just five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And today they are. And I think that's an objectively worse web that we live in today. And in shitification is the process by which we arrive there. Uh, and, and it describes a specific pattern of uh, platform degradation that exists under conditions of monopoly. So one of the things about the tech industry is that it grew up with a radical new theory of antitrust that says basically antitrust shouldn't do anything. Uh, this was Ronald <laughs> Reagan's signature achievement. He uh, hit the campaign trail the same year the Apple II Plus went on sale, literally like the tech industry and the, the antitrust abolition movement are kind of uh, twins from another mother and hmm. they grew up alongside of each other. And so uh, Inchitification describes this, this platform dynamic where platforms begin their life cycle by being good to their end users, doing what economists call allocating surplus to them. So I, I, since the great financial crisis, I've spent more than a decade learning to talk like an economist so I can make fun of them. <laughs> uh, very loosely, when an economist says someone has a surplus, they mean they have goodies. So the, the, the platforms first allocate some goodies to their end users. And once the end user are, are, are in there, they find some way to lock them in. Um, sometimes that's very simple. If it's social media, you just get locked in because your friends are there and your friends are locked in because you're there. You can't agree on where to go next. So you're just locked in. Um, other times it can be more complicated and technical. You know, Amazon might sell you a year shipping in advance so that if you quit, you're, you're out that investment. Or they may lock up all your media with digital rights management. So you have to throw it away if you divorce the platform. So once the users are locked in, then they can lure in business customers. That might be advertisers or performers, platform sellers, you know, all the people who, who uh, depend on the platform to earn a living. And they allocate a lot of surpluses to them. So maybe they stop uh, protecting the user's privacy and start spying on them so that advertisers can target ads to them. That's really a direct transfer of surplus from end users to advertisers. And, you know, Facebook, when it went open to the public in 2006, when it's, it dropped the requirement that you be a, an American university student to use it, their pitch was, don't use MySpace. It's owned by a senescent, crapulent, evil Australian billionaire who spies <laughs> on you with every hour that God sends. Use Facebook. We will never spy on you or monetize your data. And then once the users were locked in, it was like, yeah, we didn't mean it. And they, they started spying on you. If you're a performer, maybe they, they take the stuff that you post and they like non-consensually ram it down the eyeballs of people who've just asked to see what their friends have to say. And some of them like come and visit your website and generate some clicks or ad, ad clicks or, or some other form of revenue. 
Um, you know, if you're a marketplace seller, they subsidize your products, sell them below cost to customers, you know, suggest them aggressively, get, get uh, you in there and get you locked in so your customers are there, make you make uh, their platform the most important platform to be on. And once those business customers are all locked in, they withdraw the surplus from them and they allocate it to themselves. And then the platform turns into a pile of shit. <laughs> and, 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 you know, this is like where Amazon or where, um, well, Amazon's there too, but where Facebook really is now. I mean, you can tell because they changed their name. They're like, now we're not, we're not Facebook. We're a new company dedicated to the proposition that the future is all of us being legless, sexless, heavily surveilled, low polygon cartoon characters in a virtual world named after a concept from a literal dystopian science fiction novel. <laughs> and the way we get there is that the equilibrium, this is another dumb economics word, the equilibrium, which is to say the state that these companies want to reach is one where they've withdrawn all the surplus that can be withdrawn without the users actually saying, there's no reason for me to stay here anymore. They want to surf this wave right at the edge of absolute uselessness. And on the other side of that edge is I can't afford to leave, even though I hate it. And the thing about that equilibrium is it's so brittle. You know, someone goes off and like, you know, live streams their mass shooting or a whistleblower comes out or, you know, there's some horrible privacy scandal or an abuse scandal on the platform. And people can go from like, I can't afford to leave this, even though I hate this, to I hate this and I'm going in mm -hmm. just a hot instant. And that's kind of the life cycle of platforms. And the problem as I see it is that um, intermediary regulation, the regulation that we put on these platforms that intermediate between uh, users and business customers is mostly um, designed around the idea that they are like eternal, that we will just always be using Google or Facebook or Apple or Amazon. And that the priority of policymakers should be to regulate intermediaries to make them better at being our eternal overlords rather than making it easier to leave them and making it so when they collapse, it doesn't hurt us. And these are really intention, right? If you're going to say, well, you have to police all the content on your platform to prevent harassment, you're really also saying you can't just be some random person who hosts 10,000 people on a Mastodon instance. It's got to be one or the other. And so if we're going to say, okay, well, uh, we want to have lots of smaller places where people can make their online lives, not least because those you know people hosting 10,000 other people can't go and bribe Congress not to pass comprehensive privacy legislation. So they're you know neither too big to fail nor too big to jail. Then maybe what we say is instead of Facebook being responsible for moderating everything on the platform, we say Facebook has to make it really easy to leave by joining you know the federated services and by giving you all the data you need to quit Facebook but continue to follow and be followed by the people you used to be in touch with on Facebook. Okay, there's a, there's a lot here, and I was fascinated by the piece and this argument. I, I'm actually just going to read the opening paragraph of this because it, I mean, to summarize what you've just said, it, it puts it very pithily. Uh, you're right. Here is how platforms die. First, they are good to their users. Then they abuse their users to make things better for their business customers. Finally, they abuse those business customers to claw back all the value for themselves. Then they die. And you do not you do seem to have identified a, a sort of like cycle that maybe just has emerged out of the dynamics of online life and capitalism and maybe one or two other like systemic forces because if you look at yeah the way that a lot of exciting stuff happened on the internet you know 12 15 years ago 20 plus years ago then things started getting locked in and sort of most people now i think would agree that like things have gotten worse online and there's a lot less fun and it's a lot more uh depressing and annoying to participate in in online life uh so this does sort of seem to be like some sort of like rule of the system we've set up that that you've identified so i i found this all very interesting and, and, and sort of the news peg for the piece was about TikTok. a story came out that TikTok was what do they call it um heating tool heating tool which you know the TikTok algorithm it's supposedly like the greatest one ever created to show you exactly the content you want. And they claim that they didn't mess with the algorithm to prioritize one thing or another, but it turns out that they do. And a content creator will get, you know, boosted to tens of or hundreds of millions of viewers and go super hot and viral. And then, so that's good for that particular person. So that's sort of like the second phase of, um, of what you've identified. Like now they're sort of intervening and making things, good for people who you know not 
end users, not normal people, but like content creators or businesses or something. But this is sort of a false, uh, a like false panacea for those type of people. And you you have another metaphor about the, um, you know, like a fairway where someone is walking around with a giant teddy bear. They've won it in a, you know, game of chance. But of course, the, the game of chance is rigged and the carny <laughs> allows, you know, one or two people to win so that it looks like it is possible to win. And that draws in, you know, draws in the suckers. <laughs> and they, yeah. uh, And of course, they can't possibly win. Yeah, I mean, a giant teddy bear is very conspicuous, and so is Joe Rogan getting a hundred million dollars, right? <laughs> um, sort of shaped. I, they're sort of shaped the same way. The giant teddy bear and yeah, Rogan himself. And so, you know, after I wrote this, I've been writing other pieces on it and trying to flesh out the idea. And one of the things I w- I'm at pains to point out is that there is like a specific, identifiable set of systemic causes that lead to enshittification. and they suggest uh, systemic policy remedies too. That this isn't like just the great forces of history mysteriously bearing down upon this moment to create this pattern. <laughs> this is this is down to, I think, three factors. One is is universal and and runs across all industries in this moment of uh, at the end of a 40 year experiment in non enforcing competition law, which is just uh, concentration. Right. There's there's nowhere else to go. The companies can suborn their regulators. They have tons of extra money that they can use for policy entrepreneurship to make their products worse, but to make it harder to leave because of the law. Um, All of that stuff is like, that's true. Whether you're a professional wrestler in a world where there's one professional wrestling league, or whether you're someone in logistics in a world where three companies control all the shipping, or, you know, whether you're worried about finance in a world where there's like four giant banks, right? These are, these are true across the board. See also railroads, eyeglasses, cheerleading, athletic shoes, beer, spirits, you know, you name it. But then there's like two very distinctly digital areas to enshittification. And the first is that digital platforms and and digital technology more broadly is extremely flexible. It's really easy to change it on the fly. So, Mm. you know, if you're Jeff Bezos, grocer, owner of Whole Foods, and you want to play around with price gouging for eggs, you need an army of teenagers with pricing guns that you send out into the store to reprice the eggs every time you want to change the prices and see what happens. If you're Jeff Bezos, grocer, owner of Amazon Fresh, which is the online grocery platform, you just twiddle a knob, you move a slider, and the price changes. And I call this twiddling. And, you know, platform users, especially performers, but also platform sellers, other business customers, they spend a lot of time engaged in what in the Soviet Union they used to call Kremlinology. <laughs> right. You know, read the tea leaves to try and figure out what the power brokers inside the system will or won't tolerate, what they like and what they don't like. And you see it with, you know, YouTubers and going like, oh, I can't swear in the first 15 seconds or we'll be demonetized. Make sure there's more red in the thumbnail. Um, nothing more than 18 minutes. You know, just this kind of... Um, it's it's like it's like watching people try to appease uh, uh, capricious gods, um, <laughs> right? It's what, it's totally opaque, like what actually you know gets the algorithm fired right. up. But it's and, not just opaque. That's my point. Okay. It's also changeable. So they might be right, right? They might have you know devised a falsifiable experiment in the form of an A B split that that yields up a true fact about what the algorithm is seeking or what it will downrank. But then someone goes and touches their knob again and the algorithm changes, right? And these guys just can't stop touching their knobs, right? And (laughs) that is one of the reasons that it is so hard for either end users or business customers to figure out how to conduct themselves so that their behavior benefits them instead of the shareholders of the platform. Then the final piece I just want to, sorry, just to jump in. What you make me think of is sort of the, you know, the idea of like, like a parent who is, you know, their affection is inconsistent. And so some some things you do makes mommy happy. And then you you do that thing again and mommy isn't happy this time. Right. And so that makes unhappy children. And we're all sort of the unhappy children of the online, you know, mommies and daddies who are made, who made these rules perhaps unintentionally, but yeah, then, then are like, okay, you know, uh, making the soy face in your screenshot caption on YouTube that's right. no longer like yeah. works for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, the, the, the term of art for the, you know, legion of self-described evil sorcerers who just rediscovered B.F. Skinner is variable reinforcement. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, it makes people crazy, right? To get, to be on a variable reinforcement schedule. Yeah. And, and ch you know, children who grew up this way end up in therapy yeah. <laughs> and an online yeah. life often makes you feel like, you know, you need, you need online therapy for, for how bad online life has gotten. Yeah. So then there's this other piece, which is um, the user twiddling. So, you know, the, the flexibility of digital platforms cuts both ways. You know, the, the ad blocking is the largest consumer boycott in the history of the world. And it's really just a twiddle back, right? You, you, you know, the, the publisher throws a bunch of ads up and says, this is the bargain. You know, um, you want to look at my website. I'm going to spine you comprehensively from asshole to appetite. If you don't like it, go fuck yourself. And you make a counter offer and you say, how about not? Nah? How about I just don't <laughs> see any ads, right? Yeah. And, and that bargaining actually produces some pretty interesting equilibria, right? That's how we lost pop-up ads. You know, I'm, again, I'm an old guy. So I remember when like you'd visit a web page and 50 pop-up ads would spawn and they wouldn't just be like new windows. Some of them be like one pixel by one pixel and effectively invisible. And they'd run away from your mouse and they'd auto play tunes, you know, like the way that we got rid of pop-up ads wasn't by Congress passing, you know, the anti-pop-up ad of 1993. <laughs> it was by... Um, first uh, Opera and then Mozilla and then eventually all the browsers putting, um, or rather Netscape maybe, putting yeah. uh, pop-up blockers in that were on by default. And so when the advertisers went to the publishers and they said, um, you know, I don't care that your readers hate it. You got to show us, you got to serve pop-up ads because we think they work. The publishers could say, yeah, absolutely. You're in charge. You know, man's got to eat. But I got to tell you, like, we have the user statistics for our site. And if it's a pop-up ad, 95% of people won't see it. And that's what changed advertisers' conduct, right? It was not, not regulation. It was the twiddle back. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to do, to do a pop-up ad for an app, you would have to remove the DRM from that app. Removing DRM from an app is a felony under Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium, <laughs> Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, punishable by a $500,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence for a first offense. And so you don't get to twiddle back. If you write a plugin, if you do a mod, if you do an overlay, they'll say you're violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, a cybersecurity law that is farcically broad that Ronald Reagan passed <laughs> in a panic after watching Matthew Broderick in the movie War Games. Um, wow. They'll say that you're engaged in <laughs> tortious interference with contract. You're violating a copyright. You're violating a patent. You know, they have this whole parade of horribles and they'll reduce you to radioactive rubble and then bomb it until it bounces. And so you don't get to twiddle back. So then we have this world, right? A world where firms are neither constrained by competition nor by regulation, and they can twiddle with every hour that God sends, changing the rules so that it's virtually impossible to get a good deal out of them. And it is illegal for you to twiddle back. And that is a world where you are gonna get twiddled to death, <laughs> right? But it, but it also suggests some policy remedies. You know, we know what to do about traditional competition issues. We do antitrust. We're doing it. First, uh, antitrust enforcers in two generations are in office that actually give a shit. Lena Khan at the FTC, Jonathan Cantor at, at the DOJ, and their staff, Rebecca Slaughter, and so on. These are people who are doing amazing work, and they have co uh, colleagues and collaborators all over the world, South Korea, the UK, the European Union, even the Chinese Cyberspace Directive is full of this stuff. So this is a global phenomenon. But then we need to attend to these sui generis technical characteristics of enshittification. So on the one hand, we got to get their fingers off their knobs. So we got to pass laws that make it illegal for them to twiddle. And one way to, to do that is to impose a strong federal privacy law with a private right of action, which limits a whole bunch of data collection. Another one is to pass what, fair labor what, what laws. Is, what, is private, what does that mean, private right of oh, action? Oh, it means you get to sue instead of waiting for a federal prosecutor to take up your case. The business lobby hates it. Anytime you hear okay. the urban legend about the lady who got $20 million because her McDonald's coffee was too hot, that's because someone is proposing a law with a private right of action and they want to make it illegal to sue them. They want to make it so that only federal prosecutors who are biddable through a corrupt political process will ever be able to use this law. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so private right of action absolutely non-negotiable. We need one. You know, the reason the Americans with Disability Act works is because you can sue a firm on behalf of a person with a disability if they don't make accommodation, right? You don't have to wait for, uh, you know, uh, the local DA or whatever to take the case up. So there's a mix of lawyers, some of whom, you know, could most charitably be called ambulance chasers, other of whom are impact litigators interested in human rights. 
who go out there and they make sure that businesses do what they're supposed to do. And that's why ADA works. And, you know, nobody likes being on the wrong end of a lawsuit, but ADA compliance is not hard, right? All you have to do is like, when you're putting a new door in your hotel, you have to make sure that it's wide enough for a wheelchair to go through. We're not talking about, you know, moving the entire hotel a couple inches to the left. And so a private right of action is absolutely, absolutely essential. We need um, uh, fair labor laws that restrict the ways that platforms twiddle their workers, whether they're Uber drivers, DoorDash drivers, or creative workers on the platforms. And we need other laws that generally impose duties of fairness on these platforms. And this is not a law like repealing Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which would be the biggest gift you could give to Facebook of any, because it would mean that only platforms as big as Facebook could afford to operate because they'd have to moderate everything every user said, which would mean that uh, every other platform would go extinct in an instant and no new platforms would ever be formed. And Mark Zuckerberg would be our our eternal social media czar for the rest of it, <laughs> the rest of time. It's a terrible idea. Uh, the people that are most in need of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act are like independents hosting small communities where one person gets angry at another person and sues that person as well as the platform owner mm -hmm. and, and the platform owner loses their house just for providing a place where 20 people can talk to each other. And that's that's the thing that that we need to keep safe. And that's what all the proposals to modify Section 230 would destroy. So we got to limit their twiddling and then we got to immunize people who twiddle back. We need to repeal or modify laws that restrict our ability to reverse engineer, modify, skin, uh, and, and in other ways intervene in these platforms. And what we got to do is make it so that the thing that is illegal is not felony contempt of business model, not doing things that displease the shareholders of a large platform, but doing things that harm the platform's users. So that would be things like invading their privacy or defrauding them or dealing with them unfairly, which again are the same rules that we need to pass to limit the conduct of the big platforms. They should apply to people who twiddle back too. And that's how you get a kind of comprehensive whole of government in the round, private public set of remedies that actually address the problem of inshittification and make sure that people who are hard done by by the platforms get an easy landing. Okay. Now, I, I appreciate all this because, you know, the way I was describing this is like you identified like a a law of gravity or something of online life, but it, it's it's not that. It's just that the system, the way we've set it up, has encouraged this this tendency uh and that's interesting you know a, a side thought is that one change that uh, uh president donald trump brought to the gop was uh making them very excited about suing people uh mm -hmm. you know the gop used to be like against they used to say like trial lawyers were you know a big enemy and they wanted like tort reform and stuff but but trump because he you know sues so many people himself is sort of like now um you know conservatives are very excited about suing <laughs> suing people all the time yeah. and so maybe there's some bipartisan agreement on on that aspect now that everyone both sides love lawyers and, and suing people all the time yeah um, i mean i i i would love there to be some bipartisan consensus there was also a lot of republicans in the last uh congress not so much in this one in positions of real power who were really um really into the idea of antitrust for big tech but it was because they were they were worried about you know the idea that they were being shadow banned right. not because they actually cared about good platform governance and riley quinn from the trash future podcast he says you know you could appease these guys by replacing the stolen land acknowledgement at the start of some meetings with a stolen likes acknowledgement at every board meeting for every social media company right we we the board of twitter uh you know hereby acknowledge that we sit on the um on the on the stolen likes of conservative <laughs> culture warriors um yes we you know we've all yeah everyone is always wondering why their content is not doing as well as they think it should be um and uh, shadow banning is the conspiracy theory that a lot of conservatives embraced well, and, you know, there is a kind of shadow banning, right? But it's not shadow banning for ideology's sake. Right. It's shadow banning to make you pay $8 for a blue tick. Right. Right. Which you, which you uh, did for at least some length of time. Are you still? I, I, have, I have it. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, How has your experience I mean, been? I assume you, you well, were, were you verified before? Yeah. yeah. No, I was verified before. And I went from posting threads. So, I, you know, the 
I, I have a, uh, a, a transmedia social media presence. So I, I was, I am one of the owners of, and was one of the editors of Boing Boing, which is one of the oldest blogs I wrote it for 20 years. And after I left Boing Boing about three years ago, I, I built this kind of multimedia platform where everything goes out simultaneously as a blog post, an RSS feed, an email newsletter with no ads or tracking a Twitter thread, a Mastodon thread, a Tumblr post, a medium post, <laughs> uh, and it all goes out all at once. It, it's a lot of, lot of manual labor. It's not, people are like, tell me about your Python scripts. <laughs> like my Python scripts are mostly just me. There are some Python scripts in there, but mostly it's just me. And, um, I used to post these threads on Twitter and get, you know, 250 to a million views on the thread. I got a half a million followers and I was getting like a hundred. And then I paid the $8. Now I'm getting like a hundred thousand to a million. It does seem like, you know, nice social media following you have there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Yeah. It's sort of the implicit thing happening now, which, which fits in to your thesis of like, yeah, it's not like you got to pay up if you want, um, you know, if you want to spread your content. And I guess, you know, Twitter is maybe the, the difference between like consumer and creator is, is very thin on Twitter because a random person can, or at least in the pre-Musk era, could go viral or someone with no, you know, no independent platform could attract something on yeah. there. Um, whereas maybe that's different on Facebook or, or YouTube or something. Um, you also had in the article you wrote about this idea of um, net heads versus bell heads, bell yeah. being ma bell and sort of, yeah, this makes me think of what you were saying earlier about the, um, you know, the pop-up blocking, there was sort of a, you know, should the internet be like sort of an open system or more of a closed system? And like, so email would be an example of a open system where you can, you know, you don't have to pay, you use a metaphor about caller ID, like you mm -hmm. don't have to pay. You, it, the internet could have been set up where Prodigy charged you extra if you wanted to see who your email was from in the subject line or something like that. And they decided, you know, it made more sense not to do that and for everyone to sort of have an equal playing field in terms of early email. But mostly we've moved to a more like closed, closed yeah. off system. It's a, it's the, it's what, uh, you know, the bell system used to have where like anytime a new feature came along, somebody owned that feature, somebody owned the right to bring you that feature, the, the operator, and they got to monetize that feature. It was basically the urinary tract infection business model <laughs> where, you know, every click uh, came in a slow burning dribble with a price tag attached to it instead of that healthy gush that you get on the net where someone makes a new service and you just get to use it. Maybe they charge you for it, maybe they don't, but no one in the middle charges you for it. It's just you and the people at the edge. And what, what the... Uh, tech monopolists are so eager to do is is turn themselves back into the Ma Bell that they slayed. You know, uh, die a disruptor or live to be the phone company is basically the message here. Yeah, and it, I mean, it does like, you know, there's some, the way the internet is set up now, there is there are various forces pushing towards monopoly, like um, the fact that Twitter, despite getting a lot worse, like is still around and Mastodon has not conquered Twitter, like just the, the network effect and it's annoying to leave sort of things make it so that a monopoly sort of like quote unquote naturally forms, but then like they, they prop it up through uh, the algorithms and possibly, you know, like antitrust sort of actions and stuff like that. Um, well, yeah, but... I mean, there are a bunch of policies at work, right? So again, it's not like mysterious forces. It's specific policies that, that give uh, Twitter its durability. So, for example, it has um, it blocks interop with Mastodon. So when you leave Twitter, there's no graceful way to reestablish your connections with the people who've left Twitter as well and find them on Mastodon. Um, there's certainly no way for people who are um, who who have left Twitter to uh, uh, send messages to the people who are still on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That's like extra engineering they've done. You know, uh, Blaine Cook, who who designed the Twitter API, it's basically he designed it to be ActivityPub. ActivityPub was kind of in the works at the same time. And, you know, they they've basically removed that feature to, to make it harder. I, I think you need to understand also that um, new platforms tend to have a, a scalloped growth curve where it goes up quite a bit and then it sinks back to a new equilibrium that's higher than the old one. Um, so, you know, every time there's a crisis, every time 
something terrible happens on Twitter, more people decide it's not worth staying and they go. And because it's a, a system built on um, network effects, right? You know, you've joined Twitter because your friends are there, your friends are on Twitter because you're there. Uh, when key linchpins in the network leave, um, it becomes easier for other people to leave too because the people they're there for aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Dana Boyd has written about this rather a lot. She was, I believe, the first anthropologist at, at Google. She had been at MySpace and Intel and various other places. And, and she says, you know, when she was at MySpace during the last days of MySpace, she watched as key linchpins in the social graph bailed on MySpace. And then all of a sudden, everybody who was only there because, well, it's the only place I can talk to so-and-so, they left too. It was no longer worth being there. And so I think that, you know, we, we need to understand this as like, um, as, a, as, a, as a phenomenon that like doesn't happen all at once, right? It's a phenomenon that has like a, an expected set of patterns. And the fact that, that people join Mastodon and then a bunch of them left is less important than the fact that people join Mastodon and a bunch of them stayed. Mm-hmm. Do you, I mean, Twitter is in this weird zombie state where it's, it seems like it's constantly getting worse. And I've noticed that a lot of the quote unquote normal people or the normies have, you who are, you know, if you were on Twitter, like in 2022, you were not so normal, but even, but normal right. for Twitter, those people have sort of drifted away. And there were some prominent people who made a big deal about leaving. And then a few of those ended up coming back quietly because sure. it's so addictive but I think it's really is sort of like a dying ecosystem, which is good, I think, because Twitter is like bad for humanity. Like I'm, I'm rooting for it to to collapse. Do you have any, you know, predictions or do you do you think it'll just like bumble along in this zombie like state or could it just become like the MySpace of of our day? So MySpace still exists. Right. Um, you know, the future tends to compost the past. It doesn't it doesn't. Uh you know, dispense with it. It doesn't, doesn't overwrite it. There are very few tabulas rasa. There's an old saw. It's, it's not entirely true. Historians get pissed off when you, when you simplify it this way, but there's this old saw that goes, um, this, the width of the Roman road was determined mm. by the, uh, width of the Roman chariots wheelbase, which in turn was determined by the, um, the, uh, metallurgical praxis of, of Roman blacksmiths. And, uh, those roads, uh, were the the basis for modern roads. And so uh, carts were sized to have the same wheelbase as the Roman roads. And then cars were subsequently sized to fit on cart tracks. Mm -hmm. And so they also had the same size wheelbase. And then, of course, trucks were sized to have the same wheelbase as cars because they shared a road with them. And then um, intermodal transport, like rail cars, had to have the same size wheelbase because you had to be able to transfer goods from a truck to a, a, a rail car and they transported the shuttles reusable rockets by rail and so <laughs> the rocket's size was determined by the um you know the the wheelbase of the roman chariot right so you know twitter is never gonna go entirely like we're still gonna be building things that are sort of 280 characters long, you know, <laughs> even long after Twitter has gone to 500 characters and, and uh, again, long after um, other things have, have come to pass that, you know, obviate the need for Twitter. There's still, there's still going to be some lurking Twitter in a lot of our stuff. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So maybe I'd compare it more to like, you know, like a chicken pox infection or something that like lingers in the blood, um, you yeah. know, as, as an adult, but, um, but yeah, but Twitter also is sort of like the most accidental of the major platforms in a way, like something like Facebook or something like Instagram makes a lot or something like Amazon to be at least makes a lot more sense than Twitter, which was sort of like random that it be and, and more contingent. And like the fact that Trump used it was a weird contingency and so forth. So yeah, it could have, it could be an, Twitter could be an evolutionary dead end, I guess is what I'm saying, uh, where not a lot comes off of it, although it certainly is, you know, useful in, in various ways. I mean, I mean, I think that Twitter's actual forte was it's um, the combination of having this game like element of 280 characters mm -hmm. where it became a kind of game for how much can you like how much thought can you put into 280 characters? And, you know, there's I mean, it literal... used to be 140. It was 140 for most. Yeah, of 140. There were some literal um, 
uh, games. You know, there were literal competitions like, can you write a C program that fits in a tweet that does something interesting? You know, so there was there was a lot of like kind of formal challenge that is not dissimilar to the formal challenge of like, what can you put in a sonnet, right? What can you squeeze into a, any other? <laughs> yes, it was of... a form. Yeah, but it was a much more open form than a sonnet because you only had originally 140 characters and you weren't trying right. to ride. But no, but yeah, sort of. Yeah, it, it was it encouraged a, it was... more creativity than like Facebook yeah. did. But um. But, but yeah, I think it's it was more all it always should have been just for like weirdos like making jokes and stuff. Right. And... But it was also very generative on the back end in that it had this very open API that was, you know, closely related to Activity Pub. And people built a lot of cool Twitter stuff mm -hmm. that that, you know, helped um firms or, you know, hardcore terminally online people auto post and post and manage their Twitter presence. Uh, it helped people make really cool and weird and interesting bots. Like there was a lot of stuff that happened yeah. that was part of of Twitter's commitment to generativity. And and I think that was a sincere commitment. I think that, you know, they they speed ran some unfortunate lessons about content moderation. Um, I think they made some bad decisions about moving into repressive countries to open ad agency ad uh, sales offices <laughs> on the grounds that it would uh, maximize the the. Um, revenues from those countries and they couldn't afford to be elsewhere but then it, it created these enforcement nexuses with countries like turkey that then produced these tensions with their free speech commitment um and, but i i think that you know the generativity was was absolutely sincere well-intentioned and extremely powerful yeah i mean you know like jack uh, dorsey said things both like it should have been like it shouldn't have been a company. It should have been a protocol or something. You know, I, I maybe I'm yeah. He's sort terms. of paraphrasing um, Mike Masnick. Protocols, uh, protocols, not products. But at the same time, he said, you know, the 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 person who I trust to take over this project is Elon Musk. So so yeah. he's a sort of person who had some you know interesting <laughs> ideas. No, and... he's a he's a very bad person. <laughs> uh, you know, I th but he I had think that I mean, he had more of an clear. he did seem to have more of an ideological commitment to things than like Mark Zuckerberg, who just is like wants to make as much money and have as much power. Whereas like Jack is like a weirdo libertarian, like who yeah. meditates and stuff. Um, yeah. And that strangeness may be embedded itself in the, uh, in the product itself. I mean, Jack, I, I actually think that um, one of the elements of Jack's strangeness is he was King log and was barely there a lot of the time. So I think it would be a mistake to attribute too much to him because uh, there was a lot of dereliction of duty, I think. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it you never know, seemed like a very well-run company, and it's just poorly yeah. run it in a different way now. With like, yeah, I mean, I think it's more like the irrational exuberance of the shareholders in in giving Twitter so much money to lose allowed for a great deal of experimentation. Some of it extremely ill-starred, but not all of it, and that this produced some pretty cool outcomes as well as some terrible ones. Yes. Okay. No, and, I, I'd agree with that. And the promise of being that kind of playground. I think attracted a lot of people who were interested in doing things like um, figuring out how to do anti-harassment content moderation. Like that was, you know, that was a thing that was really a big piece of the foment in Twitter. Uh, it wasn't, you know, again, it wasn't always well executed, but it was like a thing that there was like this, you know, the, the, the reason people got all hand ringy about the death of Twitter's trust and safety team is that, uh, Twitter had a trust and safety team that for all that it had some weird ideas, had a lot of ideas, like a lot of really kind of next generation, interesting ideas, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that they did that, um, you know, in retrospect, I'm like, that was very interesting. Like, uh, determining, you know, who can reply even is kind of a big one. The mm -hmm. mute button is really big. Like the mute button is super interesting because, you know, who would have thought, a way to let people read your messages and reply to them so other people can see them, but you can't mm -hmm. as, as a, as an interesting remedy. And they don't know the problems. Hmm? It's different from the block because you know that you're blocked yeah. and they don't even know it. Right. And also they don't know it. You never tell them that, that, that it's happened. Right. Like <laughs> what a super interesting kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it, I think all, Twitter also attracted you know, some of the like smartest and funniest people in the world and some of the most like deranged, um, you know, worst people in the world at the same time. And I mean, as users. Just, yeah. Yeah. As users. For sure. um, 
and you know the the if it could return to being like the weirdos from like 2013 or something that would be fine with me and like but i think maybe that was if that was ever a golden age it's <laughs> maybe and maybe i'm imagining that it was a golden age it's i think maybe we're past sure. that but hopefully something yeah these i don't know the, Obviously, the, funny, they, the funny smart people are still hanging around and they want to express themselves in funny smart ways so. so i think if you want to understand like the terroir of twitter <laughs> it is this it is this mix as you say of the people who were there early and set some cultural norms and you know this is where the discussion about black twitter is really important and queer twitter because there were a lot of social norms that crept into kind of mainstream twitter from those communities but then it was also the kind of the soil in which it germinated which is this, you know, very fecund, generative place that the engineers who came there interested in this commitment to this like mix of openness, both in speech norms and in technological platform design, uh, and who many of them were very compassionate towards users who are very upset and who had this company where there was just like no adult supervision. <laughs> and so they could just like duke it out internally and and produce this like welter of seemingly contradictory and incoherent features some of which were very good i think it made for uh, an interesting thing i think like all so-called golden ages it was intrinsically unstable because you can see the contradictions in there sort of pulling apart at the fabric but also you see that it was it did produce some real richness Yes, and and now it's the complete opposite of that of a one you know one god emperor child um you know ruling ruling and making his uh his snap decisions and and so forth so it's probably headed for the ash heap of technological history more or less I think but and I would probably although be, uh, with to that. come back to where we started I think there's going to be weird remnants of Twitter embedded in our our world for many years to come i mean donald trump is you know his yeah. presidency was enabled by twitter and uh we can't erase him from history so I mean, <laughs> think about think about the the gif right and the fact that we call it a gif because the person at CompuServe who made it decided it was called a gif you know like it's very hard to to shake the uh the the deep roots of your technological past you know i, I have a, a friend uh danny o'brien who says that Irish people are denial of service attack on PHP because every apostrophe is rendered as backtick uh, apostrophe. And if you're <laughs> progressing through a series of forms, you can get to this point where in the final end of the form, your name is Danny O backtick apostrophe, backtick apostrophe, backtick apostrophe, <laughs> backtick apostrophe, backtick apostrophe, backtick apostrophe, backtick apostrophe, Brian. <laughs> okay, yes, there's the... You know, it, it is sort of like a evolutionary tree and we're and we're descended from, you know, the like trilobites or something of, right. of, of the Internet of the Internet era. OK, maybe we should wrap things up there. Is there anything else you want to mention before before we finish? Well, I can mention that I have a, a book out, Choke Point Capitalism, that's about uh, creative labor markets and the way that choke points are used to exploit them and how copyright isn't a good remedy for this. But other market interventions are. I wrote that with my colleague, Rebecca Giblin. It's doing very well. We, we just come off a, um, a tour and opening up uh, South by Southwest and the reading series, and, and it's getting lots of lovely notices. And I'm about to have two more books come out. Um, the first one is a novel from Tor Books called Red Team Blues. That's a cryptocurrency heist novel that's really <laughs> just a kind of lament about the enshittification of Silicon Valley told from the point of view of a forensic accountant who unwinds um, tech scams and whose last job is this this cryptocurrency heist. And then the next book is called The Internet Con from Verso. That's coming out in the autumn. And it's about interoperability and how you build an interoperability policy that you can actually realize, that you can enforce, and that will actually weaken the tech giants. So that's Red Team Blues in April and The Internet Con in uh, September. Okay, great. Both of those sound fascinating. Uh, you're obviously very busy, so thank you for taking the time. Not at all. I didn't even tell you about the other book that's coming out this year. I write when I'm anxious. I have seven books in production. We could go on at some length here. <laughs> okay, well, maybe, maybe when one of them comes out, we can have you back on to sure, dig into that. that. Would be very but nice. um, let's end things here for now. So. If people want to find you online, where you said you you know you're sending things out, go to, to go to pluralistic. At once. Yeah, pluralistic.net has got links across the top. RSS website twitter tumblr mastodon 
uh, an email list that has no tracking. The blog has no tracking. And it's all Creative Commons attribution only. So you can reuse it commercially, rewrite it, provided that you identify that I was the original author, link back to the original, link to the license, and note where you've modified it. Okay, great. And people can, you know, they can like this, they can smash that subscribe button, they can tell their friends, they can do all sorts of things. Um, oh, I so don't have any of those, but they can do that for you. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, okay, well, thank you, Corey, for coming on. And uh, the links to all the things mentioned, uh, especially the, the main article, will be in the show notes. And uh, thanks to all the listeners out there. We'll see you again next time. All right, thank you.